So welcome to the 18th lecture. In this lecture, we will uh, restate our four functions theorem in a slightly different context. Okay, and uh, in fact, most of the uh, this lecture would be about describing the context. You know, if you already know the theory of lattices and uh, in particular distributive lattices, then most of these things can be you know easily skipped over by you. But I'm not assuming that uh, all the all the students in this course uh, know about distributed uh, distributive lattices, and hence I'll be uh, uh, stating most of the definitions and properties that we will require in order to. Uh, state and prove the four functions theorem on distributive lattices. So, but before starting the distributive lat lattice uh, description, just keep recall of what was the four functions theorem. Uh, the four functions theorem talked about naturally four functions alpha, beta, gamma, delta from the so from some power set 2 power n to positive or non-negative real numbers. I should be clear that which satisfies this uh, condition for two any two sets A and B subset of n okay so if it satisfies this alpha beta and gamma delta satisfies you know this condition which is sometimes called log supermodularity and so on this condition for each two points in the domain which means each two subsets of n then it will satisfy the same property for collection of points of the domain okay where script a and script b are now collection of points or equivalently family of subsets and the uh, agenda in this lecture is to replace this power set of n with any distributive lattice. In fact, we won't do it, we won't go to yeah, that generality, we will restrict to finite distributive lattices. Okay, so yeah, now let's see, uh, we'll build the definition of distributive lattice uh, uh, slowly. Uh, we'll, should, we'll start with the definition of a post set, which I assume most of you are familiar with. So, post set consists of both a set as well as a relation, a binary relation defined on that set, which uh, you know this is usually called the precedes or precedence relation. And uh, uh, this relation should satisfy all the conditions for a partial order, which is reflexivity, uh, which is reflexivity, anti-symmetry as well as uh, transitivity. Okay. So, this is what is a partial order. Classic examples are natural numbers under the less than or equal to relation, uh, subsets under, uh, sorry, sets under the subset subset or equal to relation, natural numbers under the divisibility relation. These are all classical examples of partial orders. Okay. And uh, in, a, in a given a partial order, we can actually define the supremum as well as the infimum of a subset of sets. Okay? So, in particular, let us first define the supremum or the minimal upper bound. Okay? So, first think of the supremum as an upper bound and then think of the fact that it is among all the upper bounds the minimal one. In fact, that is how it is formally defined also. Right? So, supremum of a subset of elements, x remember is the whole post set and s is a subset of x. Uh, is is the is a least element so there are two conditions uh, but first think about it's a least element among whom it is among those which are greater than all the elements in s so collect all the elements which are greater than each element in s and then pick the least element among them that is the supremum of a set okay or formally we say that some element a is a supremum uh, is a supremum of not another element is supremum of some set S if for A dominates or A is A succeeds you know this is the opposite of precedes or every element in S precedes A as well as for any other B which satisfies condition 1 among all those guys A should be A should precede all of them okay. So, this is called the supremum in a set okay. What are some but by the way, note that in a general partial order, the supremum may or may not exist and even where it exists, it may or may not be uh, unique. But let us see some uh, examples. Okay? So, let us consider the most common partial order which is natural numbers under less than or equal to. Uh, uh, I, mean, uh, I think most of you would have verified it a hundred times whether this is a partial order or not. Okay? What would be supremum of a set? It would be just our normal idea of the maximum element. It is greater than or equal to each element in the set as well as it is the smallest such guy. Okay? That is the definition of the supremum just reduces to maximum in, in this case. Whereas, in among natural numbers, if you let us say take the set of all even numbers, then you can verify that the supremum does not exist. Okay? 
another example natural numbers under the divisibility relation so here we say that uh, x is less than y if x divides y and the divisibility x and the divisibility relation if you consider a supremum i mean uh, i think you should pause and guess what is the supremum of a set of elements okay i'm hoping you guess the answer it turns out to be the least common multiple okay so and uh, why did i choose these two examples in particular this kind of tells you why your uh, you know the clock is divided into 12 hours on each half day and uh, why 60 minutes per hour and 60 seconds per minute okay the the good thing about these numbers 12 and 60 are that they are the lcm of some you know initial few numbers which means you can easily divide them into groups of 6 groups of 5 groups of 4 etc i mean these are due to Bab i mean these ideas are due to you know babylonians uh, i mean as uh, old as that okay so yeah so the supremum in in the in the context of natural numbers under the divis divisibility relation is also something which we are familiar with this lcm okay uh, and uh, the supremum of for this power set which is uh, the the domain is a power set of some universal some ground set and the relation is subset okay in this case uh, it's easy to see that supremum just turns out to be the union of all of them okay and uh, yeah this is one example where you know for the same relation subset hood if i choose a different um, domain x you know here x was the entire power set okay so here i have uh, you know um, reduced the domain x you know into just k size subsets of n and then here you can easily create uh, even two subsets such that their uh, you know uh, what work could be its supremum unfortunately you know their union which is outside of the domain and hence not um no doesn't count okay so this is an example where the supremum does not exist okay and uh, if you take only you know even subsets uh, of n and then you consider okay so these are sets with whose cardinality is an even number under the same relation and now you've considered two these two sets you know 1 comma 2 versus 2 comma 3 uh, their union is 1 comma 2 comma 3 but that's not in your subset right your 1 comma 2 comma 3 is not is not a member of your domain you know this is your x now okay this is not an x but there are many more upper bounds in x right so for example if you take 1 2 3 4 okay i'm assuming n is greater than or equal to 4 then 1 2 3 4 is in your x but maybe if n is larger then 1 2 3 5 5 is also an upper bound and then none of them qualifies uh, to be the uh, yeah they they are both upper bounds but then we cannot say that one is less than or equal to the other okay so in this case i don't even think it will fit the definition of not unique uh, right uh, because the way we have defined it we have insisted that for any other set which does not uh, any other b which satis which dominates all of s a should be less than or equal to b so here 1 2 3 4 is not less than or equal to 1 2 3 5 under the subset relation so maybe this is also an example where uh, it does not exist okay now an infimum is similarly defined but this is now think about all the lower bounds but this time naturally you will have to take the maximal one of them okay so formally a is uh, okay this is a is an infimum of x if every s succeeds a a precedes every s as well as for any other b which satisfies condition 1 uh, your b has to be less than or equal to a okay so this is the this the symmetric definition to the supremum case okay this is what is known as the infimum okay in fact you know we really don't have to i mean in this lecture at least we won't worry about uh, the la the posets in which the infimum or supremum does not exist or is not unique this entire lecture is about lattices and lattices are defined to be those posets in which every two elements have a unique supremum and infimum okay so uh, it is it not only tells that any two elements do have a supremum and infimum which kind of rules out this example 4 example 5 etc it not only tells that but it also says that that uh, it is a unique supremum and unique infimum for every pair of objects okay now 
this just looks like one extra restriction imposed on the uh, on partial orders yeah it is true that it's just one extra restriction imposed on partial orders but then suddenly with this uh, restriction the posset start taking a you know a new life okay that's mainly because once you have this uh, unique supremum and infimum you can now define them as operators or binary operators so remember what is a binary operator on a set s so let's say a function a binary operator on a set s okay this is uh, this this notion is familiar to you it's like you know addition on integers uh, multiplication on integers etc these are all binary operators what essentially is it it is a function from s cross s to s okay so you take two and you usually you you it, it you know it takes two members of the uh, set and produces a uh, result is also a member of the set okay so but in order to uh, in order for a general you know object to satisfy this kind of a definition what essentially is needed is that for every pair you should be able to define a unique uh, element in the set itself okay so this is precisely the condition that you need to call the supremum and infimum as an operator okay so hence the supremum and once you have this property in a lattice the supremum and infimum become binary operators and once it's a binary operator rather than you know using the function notation we usually have an infix notation you know like like the plus or the minus or the multiplication right so similarly here also we have an infix notation for the supremum we use this v and for uh, the infimum we use the caret okay so this is called the join operator again just another name because i mean it maybe comes from a different context this is called the join operator or the for the supremum and the meet operator for the infimum remember you cannot call them as operators in a general partial order because neither the existence nor the uniqueness is guaranteed but lattices are those partial orders in which these qualify to be operators okay so try to Uh, remember this because in this whole lecture and the next we will be talking uh, uh, you know talking a lot about join and meet operators okay now why in, in fact even the name lattice okay uh, suddenly you know it's a surprising name right it comes up because of a lattice kind of picture this gives you you take any x y then the 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 join is this guy x o you know x uh, join y and the meet is below and like kind of you know if you extend it it looks like a pretty picture okay uh, by the way uh, you should uh, see the wikipedia page on lattices where you would see a lot of uh, examples of lattices drawn okay let me see if i can take it yeah so this is the wikipedia page uh, where you have some interesting lattices and you see the shape here you know this uh, especially this uh, divisors of 60 or this you know subsets of some three elements they have this nice uh, you know pretty pictures okay and maybe this guy here um, this guy oh okay <laughs> yeah this guy here is uh, what what a physicist or a chemist would really relate as a 2d lattice and if you take the third dimension equivalent of it you will get a, a, a similar a similar picture this is nothing but as you can see lattice of non negative integer pairs ordered component wise right so the elements are something like i comma j where both i and j are natural numbers and uh, the uh, the partial order relation is um, you know some i comma j is less than or equal to i prime comma j prime if both i is less than or equal to i prime as well as j is less than or equal to j prime okay so yeah we'll 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 see all those examples listed in the next page maybe but before that i you know sometimes this name may be confusing you can actually think of them as this v to be what would replace a union and uh, this cap what would replace an intersection right that's one way to remember it but i have a feeling i mean it's probably my guess or somebody told showed this to me long time ago that this uh, picture this symbols can also be interpreted based on uh, this okay so consider this particular partial order the domain is all real to real functions okay all real valued functions of one real variable 
so these are functions for which you can draw or usual you know our calculus graphs okay the graph of a function where x is on the x axis and on the y axis you plot either some function f or a function g and uh, the partial or the the binary relation is less than or equal to point wise okay so we say that f is less than or equal to g if and only if for each real number x f of x is less than or equal to f of g this is what we call the point wise less than or equal to sometimes we will denote this the less than equal point okay and now let's say this red line is f and this green line going down is g now what would be the 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 join operator the join operator in this case will correspond to taking come point by point the maximum okay so this is what is usually denoted as max f of g so this is a new function which will whose value is the maximum value taken by f or g at that point so this highlighted the blue highlighted guy is the the join of f and g and because of this v shape you know you see that that matches with the symbol that is used for the infix uh, notation similarly the meet would correspond to the point wise minimum and that would be this shaded yellow curve highlighted in yellow curve okay so maybe this is another mnemonic for you to remember the two symbols if you are not already uh, you know comfortable using them okay now quickly let's see some examples yeah we already saw that if you are talking about functions uh, from r to r then with under this uh, relation point wise less than or equal to then join is just the point wise maximum and the meet is the point wise minimum so n squared this is the picture that we showed from wikipedia page this n squared this is actually you know this uh, ordered pairs are in some sense a restricted kind of functions where the domain is just uh, you know two elements okay if instead of the this domain r if i can uh, think of this domain as just a set uh, a two element set 0 and 1 then n squared can be thought of as a function from a two element set to r okay the first component is the value at the first place okay by the way this is a very important model if you are not familiar with that then think about this again point wise so here also uh, what is the um, what is the join operator the join operator is still the point wise max right so or more correct if i say something like you know what is ab uh, join uh, cd this will be max of a comma c and max of b comma d okay this is similarly defined point wise minimum right and this uh, the third example if your uh, domain is the power set of n and it is subset hood relation then you know that the this uh, join is nothing but meet okay so s union t is nothing but s union t similarly s cap t is nothing but s intersection t this is also one way to Uh, remember the symbols n less than or equal to in fact this is even a special case of uh, you know 1 and 2 not a special case but something much simpler than that so here what is a or b this is just max of ab and a meet b is equal to min of ab what about uh, the divided by the same domain n but now under the divisibility condition but now your join becomes the uh, lcm of a and b and your meet now becomes the gcd of a and b right you can verify that this is the you know, in, in some sense is greatest common divisor and all exactly meets the way we define the infimum right it's greatest among all the common divisors okay and here it is the least among all the common multiples right so this meets that now yeah now like this is in some sense a restriction of four into a finite set right so here also the same guy uh, same thing applies right because this max of a comma b will be still in your n the maximum of two numbers from between 1 and n will also be between 1 and n so this is okay and the meet will be the minimum so this is also okay because the minimum among two numbers from 1 to n is also between 1 and n but now uh, look at this okay here n is something that is given to you what is this set then this set consists of all divisors of n 
you include an x only if x divides n right so this is all divisors of n under divisibility so here also the same guy you know applies you know your a or b will be the lcm of a and b but remember like since both let's say take any x and y if both x and y are divisors of n then their lcm will also be a divisor of n and hence it will be in the domain so here also the the join is uniquely defined and similarly this will be gcd of a comma b so since if x and y are both divisors of n their gcd will also be a divisor of n and hence it's also in the set so here meet is also meet also exists and is unique so these are all examples of lattices okay and among them the 3 6 and 7 are finite lattices whereas the remaining are infinite lattices natural definition it, the finite or infinite just applies to the cardinality of the ground set okay so now yeah and by the way this uh, this lecture you know there's a, there is we are building too much on the context so i cannot uh, do everything in detail so some properties which are um, uh, you know some properties i'm planning to leave as exercises okay so the first exercise is to show that both these operators the join operator as well as the meet operator are commutative as well as associative Okay, so commutativity is very very easy to show because it just follows from the definition. You know, if you look at the definition itself, uh, you can see that it is commutative. Associative, you please you know try to uh, 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 reason it out uh, uh, in a bit more of a detail. But the 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 next property that we usually look for is distributivity. But then not all lattices are distributive. Okay, and hence. For those lat, uh, by the way, by distributive, we are we can we are generally we refer to the you know like like the addition distributes over multiplication, right? We will, or maybe you know sorry, yeah, the multiplication distributes over addition, right? A times B plus C is equal to AB plus AC is probably the more famous, um, uh, is the most famous distributive law. So we generally look for meet this meet distributing over join meet distributing over join right okay but i have written it the other way around that uh, what have i written i have written as the join distributes over meet okay but yeah i know why there is a confusion because it turns out that either way you de define distributivity it turns out to be the same okay so let me go by what i have written so i'll we'll define a lattice to be distributive if join distributes over meet in fact you should just remember it and it's easier to remember it that way that a lattice is distributive if one of these operators uh, distribute over the other okay what does that mean so for all three uh, elements x y z in p x uh, jo uh, sorry x meet the join of y or z can be written this way okay x meet y join x meet z now yeah this i am leaving it as an exercise among the seven examples above right identify those which are distributive and uh, yeah but let's okay this third one though i have left uh, initially planned to leave it as an exercise uh, at least some part of it we will discuss in the lecture so this is to show that if join distributes over meet then meet will distribute over join okay that's uh, what we will i mean at least let's see one part okay so what is given we are given that the join okay so here i am i'm kind of completely yeah messing up the notation uh, right i am saying that the meet distributes over join okay but it's fine okay since i anyway written it uh, the other case is also going to be similar i'm i'm assuming that meet distributes over join and then i have to prove that the join distributes over meet okay so this is what i have to prove but i'll start with the right hand side and then uh, show that it is equal to the left hand side so the right hand side is uh, this guy but now here if i consider this whole guy as one element you know say some w then this is w meets somebody right uh, meets in fact a join of two guys but that's exactly what is given to you if w meets a join of two guys i can expand that so this uh, this is your w so that is w um, meets x joined with w meets z okay so i am just using the 
I am just applying star here where star is what is already given to you. Okay. Now again, this is a this is something that is given to you, right? This is a meet, and I can take this meet inside of this join operator. So I am actually applying star one more time. In fact, twice more. Okay, once inside this bracket and once inside this bracket, and I'll expand it this way. Okay. Now you see that all the operations outside are OR. Okay. Since it is associative, I don't have to keep track of these big brackets here, right? I can do it in any order. These brackets would have made a difference only if the operator was not associative. But you know, as exercise one, you know, we are assuming that you have verified, you have done exercise one, and hence you know that this is associative. So I can take off the brackets and also note that x um, x meet x will just be x, right? Why? Because it's a small. Again, use the definition of meet, right? It is the smallest, uh, the largest lower bound, right? And then see, you can see that x itself is the largest lower bound. Okay. Now two more observations. Once you have an x uh, joined with meet of x and something else, you will get back x. Okay. This is also something that is not very uh, difficult to verify. Again, from the definition of the uh, the join and the meet. So you want something since it's a join. You want something which is an upper bound to both x as well as y meet x. So x surely qualifies to be that upper bound. But can something smaller than x uh, is x the least one? Yes, because um, you know one of the terms itself is x, so x is the least one. Okay, so this is also something which you can maybe pause and reason out based on the uh, definition of uh, join as well as the meet. Okay, so this reduces to an x. But then again, you have a similar thing. X joined with the meet of X and Z for the same argument, you will again show that this is also X, and you will finally show the left hand side. You know, remember this is the left hand side of what we want to show. Now the same thing. Now you can go in the other direction also. You can assume that this is given to you, and then try to prove the opposite direction. You know, again start with the right hand side of this guy, and now you have a, a join operator outside, but you have an assumption about how join distributes over mean using that you apply that actually three times expand it and get back the answer okay so yeah so now this the i think the the you know apart from the 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 other corollaries of that fact it's very convenient that now you don't have to remember what in the definition of a distributive lattice should you talk about join distributing over meet or meet distributing over join both are okay yeah Okay, it's running really short of time. I don't know how much we will go. Okay, now the this is uh, one more important definition. Like yeah, after this definition, we almost get to the main theorem that we want. We are going to talk about certain elements which we will call as the join irreducible elements. Okay, this is very close to prime numbers, but not exactly. After I define these, we will. Uh, I'll also tell where they differ. Okay, so join irreducible elements in a lattice. Okay, what is a join irreducible element? An element X of a lattice is called join irreducible. If the only way in which you can express X as a join of two uh, two elements is if one of those elements was already X. Okay, so yeah, this looks like a kind of a strange definition, but intuitively it is saying that the only way you can write or decompose X. Or, or more or more succinctly i can say that x cannot be written as the join of two different guys you know two other guys guys different from x if such x's are called irreducible okay i think that's probably the easier definition to remember x cannot be uh, written as the join of two guys both which are different from x okay so if you think about natural numbers under the divisibility relation Prime numbers satisfy the requirement of irreducibility, right? Uh, there, what is the the or there the LCM, right? So if p is a prime number, and if I want to write it as an LCM of uh, numbers, it, at least one of those numbers has to be p, right? So you or in fact, if you want to write it as an LCM of two numbers. One of those numbers has to be p. You can either write it as LCM of p and p or LCM of p and one. Okay, those are the those are the only two options, right? But 
there is one uh, small you know it's irreducible is not equivalent to prime because one also qualifies the definition of uh, irreducibility right one can also be only written this way. so yeah there is a minor difference between uh, in fact there is a notion of prime elements uh, in a lattice but we won't need that in this lecture hence we won't be defining that so this is very similar to prime numbers but even it is like you know one is also allowed yeah but let's see other examples right so let's say 2 power n uh, the power set of n under subset relation what are the irreducibles what are the by, by when i say irreducible i mean join irreducibles you can verify that these are all the singletons plus in fact the empty set also right empty set cannot be remember in this case what is your uh, what is the join operator itself the join operator is the union right so the empty set if you write it as an union of two guys, then in fact, both of these, those guys have to be the empty set. And any singleton, if you want to write it as a union of two guys, at least one of them should be the same singleton. Okay, So this singleton sets satisfy the requirement of join irreducible, join irreducibility. Natural numbers under divisibility, so surely the primes satisfy this, right? But in fact, some prime powers also satisfy this. So this is another way in which irreducibles differ from primes, right? So for example, think of a number 4, okay? Uh, I, can, I can write 4 as 2 times 2, but remember multiplication is not the join operator, right? The join operator is the LCM. So can I write 4 as the LCM of some A comma B where both A and B are different from 4? Okay, so if it is an LCM, uh, if 4 is an LCM of A and B, then that in particular means both A and B are factors of or devices of 4, right? And uh, uh, even if it is 2 comma 2, it will not work, right? You need 4 comma 2 or 4 comma 1 or 4 comma 4, you know, the only possibilities are 4 comma 1, 4 comma 2 and 4 comma 4. In all those cases, you will see that 4 is one of the parts and hence it um, allows for uh, it, it satisfies the definition of join irreducibility. By the way, one also qualifies to be a irreducible, which we mentioned. And if uh, one is written to be written as LCM of two guys, it has to be one and one. Okay, so these are the irreducible. So, what about uh, natural numbers under less than or equal to? Here you can see that in fact all the natural numbers are irreducible because here the the join operator is the max, right? Remember, this is the relation here okay since the join operator is the max if you uh, if i want to write some uh, i to be some max of j and k then uh, this i has to be either equal to j or equal to k okay which means it satisfies the definition of irreducibility so here it's not very interesting in fact every number turns out to be irreducible but this still i put this because this will become interesting once we see the next theorem Okay, but before stating the next theorem, there is one small definition, it's almost like a notation. So given a X, uh, you know, given a member X in a lattice, by the way, remember this, whenever I'm talking about irreducibility, since it's about join irreducibility, you need the notion of a join. And in, since you need the notion of a join, you are talking in, you are, you are in lattices. Okay, so that is kind of, you know, I, I'm not saying uh, let L be any lattice and X be any member of that lattice but that's hopefully understood okay so this is a l is a lattice and uh, x is some member of the lattice okay then what is i of x i of x is defined to be all those irreducible elements less pre which precedes x okay so there are two conditions here one is that you should only include in i of x those y which precede x the second condition is that you should only include it if y is an irreducible element okay so these are all the irreducible elements which precede x okay maybe i'll write that down also so this is all irreducibles which precede x okay so with this definition we are ready to um, the state the, uh, the key theorem that will help us generalizing the four functions theorem to lattices, okay? So this is called the Birkhoff's 
representation theorem from 1937 okay by garrett burkhoff you know in fact while i writing this name i notice that he has three double letters you know the garrett has a double r and a double t and burkhoff has a double f okay nice name yeah so what does burkhoff's uh, representation theorem say it says that if l with this precedence relation is a finite distributive lattice so remember that this only works okay burkhoff's representation theorem only any kind of these representation theorems only work for distributive lattices burkhoff's version only work for finite distributive lattices but there are extensions there are other theorems for which the what is the what, what we are going to say can be extended to infinite distributive lattices also uh, you know wikipedia says there are at least three different ways this can be generalized to infinite uh, distributive uh, lattices but anyway we won't get into that we will only talk about finite distributive lattices and there this is quite an old theorem you know as old as 1937 and what is the theorem now it says that this function you know we have already defined what is i of x okay now given where is the domain of that function x is any member of the lattice l which means the domain of x is nothing but l and what is the codomain i of x are some subsets of the lattices right x is a member of the lattice but i of x is a subset of the lattice but then it's not any subset since it only contains the irreducible elements i can actually define one set i capital i to be the set of all irreducibles in l and then i of x is a subset of that i right so if i define i to be all the irreducibles in l i is a subset of l then this i of x will turn out to be a subset of i so i can view this codomain i can actually view the codomain also as a power set of uh, l but i can actually view it as a the power set of the codomain as a power set of i 2 to the power i okay and there is an advantage to viewing it that way because burkhoff's theorem tells you that under this case it is a lattice isomorphism okay it is a lattice isomorphism so in particular every isomorphism is a bijection okay so if you had taken 2 to the power l it wouldn't have been a it wouldn't have it wouldn't be surjective so there was no hope that it will be a bijection or an isomorphism but burkhoff's theorem says that restricted with this choice of codomain this function becomes a lattice isomorphism okay so yeah i have already defined what is i i is a set of all join irreducible elements in l okay so what is an isomorphism by the way yeah, when you have a between two sets you talk about a function being bijective but once that set has some extra um, uh, you know operators or other structures added to it like you call something as a poset isomorphism if this bijection respects the order okay so if uh, it says that a poset isomorphism would be something like if x is less than y then f of this should be if and only if f of x is also less than y and when you talk about lattice isomorphism that means this function should respect the the meet operator and the join operator right so f of x meet y should be equal to uh, sorry f of x join y should be equal to f of x join f of y f of uh, x meet y should be equal to f of x meet f of y so this tells you that burkhoff's representation theorem tells you that this function first of all it's a bijection and also it respects uh, the join and the meet operator okay how do you prove this so here i am a bit actually i am a bit confused because the uh, if you uh, do a search for the proof of burkhoff's representation theorem mostly it goes it is not limited to using irreducible elements it goes using the prime elements and so on but in the book that we are following alone and spencer just gives this proof saying that you know it will follow by considering the uh, irreducible elements uh, uh, you know just follow by considering this definition of ix okay so uh, yeah so i i hope the i have tried to put in more details to that sentence and again as i warn you once in a while this is again another proof which i want you to critically uh, look at when we are going forward okay so the key Uh, part of this proof is to show that i can recover x okay so this income somehow gives you what is the inverse function to this map okay so this map takes you from x to a, uh, a subset of irreducible which is nothing but all the irreducible which precede x now the claim here in the red or what i call as a star 
is that I can do the inverse map by just taking the join of all the guys in ix right so by the way this is a uh, you know when once you uh, define a binary operator you know something like uh, x or y maybe i want to do it for three guys x y or maybe you know four guys but instead of that if i have something like a whole set of guys i will use this kind of annotation right x element of x x this means like this is uh, all the elements of x uh, taken a join together okay since it is associative uh, as well as commutative the order since it's commutative the order doesn't uh, associative and commutative the order does not matter okay so this uh, notation i hope uh, does not you know confuse you okay and the claim is that by taking the join of all the guys in your i of x you get back x okay and then this provides the in inverse function as i told you and once you you can show that this is the inverse function it is very easy to verify uh, all these claims right this uh, x less than or equal to y if and only if i of x is a subset of i of y at least one direction is very easy right all the irreducible which precedes x by transitivity of the binary relation we are also irreducibles which pre precede y hence i of x is a subset of i of y this way implication is very easy for the other direction if i x precedes i y in order to show that x is less than or equal to y if i can prove this claim in star then it is very easy because this is the join of all the guys here or the join of this guy is y the join of this guy is x but this is a larger this is the join of a larger collection and hence this x is less than or equal to y by definition of join so if i can prove this star then all the other properties that are required for this bijection to be a lattice isomorphism is easily true okay similarly it's very easy to verify that f of x or y by the way what is this this is nothing but fx fy why because in we are mapping it to a power set and in a power set the u the the meet sorry the join just corresponds to the union okay so this is exactly the property of the lattice and this is nothing but fx uh, uh, meet f okay these are also e easy to verify right if uh, something the the set uh, set of all those guys which precede x or y will include all of this again one direction would just follow from the definition of ix for the other direction you may need this right but remember we still have in proved star so if you prove star then the remaining things uh, you can figure out by just uh, a few minutes of thought so how do we prove star again uh, since let me define this once you prove star i can define this uh, join of uh, all the elements in i of x to be x but till i have proved that i'll call i'll decide to call this as another variable z and my attempt will be to show that x is equal to z okay so let me till i have proved star i will denote this join of all the members in i of x as z and star essentially says that z is equal to x now it is easy to show that z precedes x why that in fact follows from the definition of the join operator right so this z is a, a, a minimal upper bound for all of y forget the minimal so it's an upper bound for all of y right so oh sorry so here i think i'm sorry you should not forget the uh, minimal part the minimal part is what we will use so uh, remember that x is defined to be or what are the guys in i of x i of x are all those guys which precede x okay they are irreducible also i'm not going to use the fact that they are irreducible but every member in i of x precedes x which means x is also an upper bound for i of x right so this means x is an upper bound for i of x and z is the minimal upper bound or by definition of now the join operator z has to be less than or equal to any other guy which is an upper bound for all of them so x is such a guy so z less than or equal to x right so this direction is easy okay that z less than or equal to or z precedes x so it's enough to show that x precedes z why is that true remember this is not a general this is a, this is a general partial order okay but again this is just what is known as the anti symmetry in the partial order right anti symmetry tells you that if x precedes 
uh, z as well as z precedes x in an anti-symmetric relation that means x is equal to z. So in order to prove that x is equal to z it is enough for us now to show that x precedes z. Okay. We will do it in two cases. First we will show this when x is irreducible and then using that fact we will show it for a general x. Okay. So if x is irreducible then x is a member of ix right? because ix contains remember in a partial order every element precedes x itself. So it satisfies that requirement plus x if it is irreducible will be a member of ix. Right? ix was just the set of all irreducibles that precede x. But if x is a member of ix right? then by definition or the first part of the definition of the join operator x has to be uh, you know less than or equal to the join right the join is join succeeds every member so in particular x uh, join succeeds x but join is what we call as z so z succeeds x and that is what we have to prove we have to prove that z succeeds x so for irreducibles it is clear okay now what if it is not irreducible or if it is reducible if x is reducible then means in particular you can write it as some u or v or sorry <laughs> u uh, join v where both u and v are different from x but now maybe if u and v are irreducible we will stop and continue the next part of the argument but otherwise we will keep reducing this recursively remember we are in a finite distributive lattice so i can do this operation and uh, since it's a partial order we know that we are only going to go down in the chain and this will stop at some point and we will be able to decompose x as a join of irreducibles right so this is a join of x1 x2 xk again finite so i can use a k uh, such that each of them is an irreducible guy okay now we just apply the uh, fact that we have proved for irreducibles in a careful way and we will get the proof right now since each of these xi precedes x right why by um, by the definition of the join operator, right? The, the join succeeds every element that formed the join. So in particular, x succeeds xi. This would imply that the i of xi would be a subset of i of x, right? Just transitivity. Everything that is irreducible and precedes xi, precedes x also and remains irreducible, right? So by transitivity, this is true. And hence, since each i x i is contained in i x, the union of all the i x i is, right? i equal to 1 to k, i x i is also contained here. Okay. Now, what does this mean? This means if I now take uh, this entire union and now take the or of, sorry, the join of all of that, right? This is a smaller collection than this collection. So the join of this collection, remember this entire this entire collection here just appears here okay this so since this collection is a subset of this collection the join of this collection is less than or equal to the join of the second collection okay and the join of the second collection is what we term as z by definition and now we will so the right hand side we already know so we are we are going to just analyze this left hand side what does this join uh, correspond to Okay, now this join I can now write it as two successive joins, right? So this will be a join i equal to 1 to k and this union I am splitting it as this. But here I am using the fact that, uh, uh, you know, I am using the fact that I can repeat an element because, you know, maybe two of these sets will contain the same irreducible element. So this irreducible element uh, may contain, okay, here I am... Yeah, yeah, because here this repeated element may not be counted twice in the union, but here it is counted twice, but that's okay because, uh, you know, you can easily repeat an element while taking the join uh, and uh, using the commutativity and associativity, I can regroup them so that I can write this expression in this form. Okay, and now once it is in this form, you see that the inner guy, because xi's are irreducible, we know that for an irreducible guy, if you take the join of its i set, which is i of xi, you get back that element. Okay, So this just uh, breaks down to xi, which follows from the fact that xi is irreducible. And this is nothing but by equation, you know, this is just a decomposition of x, right? By equation 1, this is nothing but x. Okay, So LHS is equal to x. So we have shown that this is just x and we have shown that this is 
uh, precedes z that's what we had to show so this finishes the fact that um, okay so i think we'll stop at this point it's already 50 minutes and we will see how this Birkhoff's theorem in fact maybe you can just uh, I'll, I'll end the video here but i uh, ask you to maybe you know try to imagine what would be the equivalent of a four functions theorem for lattices the key idea is going to be this Birkhoff's representations theorem that a finite distributive lattice is lattice isomorphic to a uh, uh, the power set lattice you know this is uh, this boolean lattice that is as it is sometimes called and the four functions theorem essentially is a statement on the boolean lattices now try to translate it to finite distributive lattice in fact doing that is going to be much more helpful to you than me stating it and like you know you trying to memorize it after that. okay thank you